free people, the origin of cultures and the advent of private property, not necessarily in that order. Changing your social identity with the changing seasons might sound like a wonderful idea, but it's not something anyone reading this book is ever likely to have experienced firsthand. Yet, until very recently, the European continent was still littered with folk practices that they hold this ancient, this ancient rhythmic oscillations of social structure. Folklorists have long puzzled over all the little baguettes of people disguised as plants and animals, the strawberries and green men who march dutifully out reach out its spring and autumn into village squares everywhere from rural England to the road of mountains of southern Bulgaria where the genuine traces of ancient practices or recent revivals and revelations or revivals or traces or traces of revivals if or is often impossible to tell. Most of these rituals have been gradually brushed aside as pagan superstition or repackaged as tourist attractions or both. For the most part, all we really all were left with as an alternative to our mundane lives as our national holidays, frantic periods of overconsumption of cover of overconsumption crammed in the gaps between work in which we entertain solid injunctions that consumption is not isn't really what matters about life. As we've seen, a remote forager and gestures were much uh, were much old bolder experimenters in social form, breaking apart and resembling their societies at different scales, often in radically different forms with different value systems, from one time of, of year to the next year. The festival calendars of the great agrarian civilizations of Eurasia, Africa, and the Americas turned out to be mere distant echoes of that world and the political freedoms it, it entailed. Still, we could never have figured that out by material evidence alone. If all we had to go on were Paleolithic mammoth buildings on the Russian steppe, or the Prince de Burias of the Ligurian SH and the associated physical remains, scholars would no doubt but would no doubt left scratching their hands their heads until the sun explodes. Human beings may be indeed with a good they are fundamentally imaginative creatures, but no one is that imaginative. You would have to be either extremely naive or extremely arrogant, arrogant to think any, any, anybody so could simply logic such matters out. And even, and, and even if someone did manage to come up with anything like newer prophets, quite killed, clown, police, or in which seasonal wife swapping origins, simply too logical extrapolation that probably be instantly written, written off as cox. This, this is precisely why the ethnographic record is so important. The newer and in which should never have been seen as window as, as windows to our onto our ancestral past. They are creations of the modern age, just the same as we are but they do so as possibilities we never would have thought and would never have thought and of proof that people are actually capable of enacting such possibilities, even building whole, syst whole social systems and value systems around them. In short, they remind us that human beings are far more interesting than other human beings are sometimes inclined to imagine. In this chapter, we'll do two things. First, we'll continue our story forwards in time for the, from the Paleolithic, looking at some one of the extraordinary cultural arrangements that emerged across the world 
Beaver Oak and Chest Dogs turn their hands to farming. Second, we'll start answering the question we posed in the last chapter. How did we get stuck? How did someone how did some human societies begin to move away from the flexible shifting arrangements that they, that they appear to have characterized our earliest ancestors in such a way that certain individuals or groups were able to claim permanent power over, over others, men over women, elders over youth, and eventually priestly castes, castes warrior aristocracies and rulers who actually ruled in which we describe how the overall course of human history has meant that most people live their live their lives on an on an ever smaller scale as populations get larger. In order for these things to become possible, a number of other factors first had to fall into place. One is the fair existence of what we would intuitively recognize as discrete societies to begin with. It may not even make sense to describe the mammoth hunters of Upper Paleolithic Europe as being organized into separate bonded societies in the way we talk about nations of Europe or for that matter first national of Canada like the Mohawk, Wendat or Montanis Capi. Of art, of course, we know almost nothing about the, the languages people were speaking in the upper Paleolithic, the myths, initiation rituals, or conceptions of the soul. But we, but we do know, but we do know that from the Swiss, from the Swiss Alps to outer Mongolia, they were often using remarkably, remarkably similar tools, playing remarkably similar musical instruments carving similar feature figurines, wearing similar ornaments, and conducting similar funeral rites. What's more, there is, a re there is reason to believe that at certain points in their lives, individual men and women often travel a very long distances. Surprisingly, current studies of hunter-gatherers suggest that this is almost exactly what one should expect. Research among groups such as the East Africa, the, 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 such as the East African Hadza or Australian Martu shows that while foraging societies today may be numerically small, their composition is remarkably cosmopolitan. While forager bands gather into larger residential groups, these are not, in any sense, made up of tight knit unit of closely related kin. In fact, primarily biological relations constitute an average a mere 10% of total membership. Most members are drawn from a much wider pool of individuals, many for quite far away, who may not even speak the same first languages. This is true even for contemporary groups that are effectively encapsulated in restricted territories surrounded by farmers and pastoralists. In, early in earlier centuries, forms of regional organization might extend thousands of miles. Aboriginal, Australian, Aboriginal Australians, for instance, could travel halfway across the continent, moving along people who spoke entirely different languages and still, and still find camps di divided into the same kinds of totemic moieties that existed at home. What this means what this means is that half of residents out them hospitality but had to be treated as brothers and sisters, so sexual relations were strictly prohibited, while another half while another half were both potential enemies and marriage partners. Similarly, a North American five year, five hundred years ago could travel from the source of the Great Lakes to the Luciana Bayus and still find settlements speaking languages entirely unrelated to their own, with members of their own beer, with, with members of their own beer, elk or beaver clans who were obliged to house and feed them. It's difficult enough to reconstruct to reconstruct 
how these forms of long distance organization operated just a few centuries ago before they were destroyed by the coming of European settlers. So we can really only guess how analogous systems might have worked some 40,000 year, 40, years ago. But the striking material uniformities observed by archaeologists across very long distances attest to the existence of such systems society insofar as we can comprehend it, comprehend it at, this, at time span conti continents. Much of this seems counterintuitive. We are used to assuming that ad that advance in technology are continually making the world a smaller place in the pure physical sense. Of course, this is true. The domestication of the horse and gradual improvements in seafaring, to take just two examples, certainly made it much easier for people to move around, but at the same time increases in the sheer number of human beings seem to have pulled in the opposite direction, ensuring that for much of human history ever diminishing proportions of people actually travelled, at least over long distances or very far from home. If we survey that what if we survey what happens over time, the scale on which social relations operate doesn't get bigger and bigger, it actually gets smaller and smaller. A cosmopolitan upper paleolithic is followed by a complicated period of several thousand years thousand years beginning around twelve thousand BC, in which it first becomes possible to trace the outlines of separate cultures based on more than just stone tools. Some forages after this time continued following large mammal herds. Other others settled on the coast and became first fishing blocks or gathered accounts in forests. Prehistorians used the term Mesolithic from these post-glacial populations. Across large parts of Africa and East Asia, their technological innovations, including pottery, microlithic tool kits, and stone grinding tools, signal new ways of preparing and eating with grains, roots, and other, and, and other veget vegetables, chopping, slicing, grating, grinding, soaking, draining, boiling, and also ways of storing, smoking, and other ways preserving meats, plant, food, plant foods, and fish. Be before long this, before long, before long this had spread everywhere, and paved the way of the set of the creation of what we know we, of what we now call season, the kind of soups, porridge, porridges, stews, broths, and fermented beverages were familiar with today. But seasons are also almost everywhere markers of differences of difference. People who walk who wake up to fish stews every morning tend to see themselves as a different sort of people from from those who breakfast on a forage of berries and wild oats. Such distinctions were not that echoed by parallel developments that are much more difficult to reconstruct. Different tastes in different tastes in clothing, dancing, drugs, hairstyles, courtship rituals, different forms of car of kinship organization, and, st and styles of formal rhetoric. The culture areas of these Mesolithic foragers were extremely large. To the Neolithic factions that soon developed alongside with them, associated with the first farming populations, were typically smaller, but for the most part, they still spread over 
the still spread out over the territories considerably larger than most modern national nation states. Only, only la much later do we begin to encounter the kind of situation familiar to anthropologists of Amazonia or Papua New Guinea, where a single river valley might contain might contain speakers of half a dozen different languages, with entirely distinct economic systems or cosmological beliefs. Some sometimes, of course, this tendency towards me towards micro differentiation was reversed was as with the spread of imperial languages like english or han chinese but the overall direction of history at least until we until very recently will seem to be very opposite of global of global globalization it is one of increasingly local allegiances extraordinary cultural inventiveness but much of it aim at finding new ways for pe for people to set themselves or themselves off against each other through large regional networks of hospitality and dirt in some places overall though what we observe is not so much the world as a whole getting smaller but most people's social works social words going more part parochial their lives and passions were more more likely to be circumscribed by bondage in culture, class, and language. And language. We might ask why all this has happened. What are the mechanisms that cause human beings to spend so much effort trying to demonstrate that they are different from their neighbors? This is an important question. We shall be considering it in much more detail in the following chapter. For the moment, we simply note that the pro pro proliferation of separate social and cultural universes, COVID in its face and relative bonded, must have contributed in, in various ways to the emergence of more durable and intransigent forms of domination. The mixed composition of so many foraging societies clearly indicates that individuals, individua, individuals were more routinely on the move of a plethora of reasons, including taking the first available exit route if one's personal freedoms were threatened at home. Cultural porosity is also necessary for the kind of seasonal demographic pulse that made it possible for societies to alternate periodically between different political arrangements, forming massive congregations at one time of year, then dispersing into a multitude of smaller units for the remainder. This is one reason why the Majestic Theatre at Palaeolithic Prince de Burials or even Stonehenge never seems to have gone too far beyond thea theatrics. Simply put, it's difficult to success a military power in, say, January over someone you will be facing on equal terms again come July. The hardening and multiplication of cultural boundaries can only have reduced such possibilities. In which we ask what precisely is equalized in egalitarian societies. The emergence of local cultural worlds during the Mesolithic made it more likely a, that a relative self-contained society might abandon seasonal dispersal and settle in some kind of full-time, top-down, hierarchical arrangements, arrangement in our terms to get stuck. But of course, this, this in itself hardly explains what any particular social did. In fact, we get stuck in, a, in such arrangements. We are back to something not entirely different from the origins of social inequality problem. But by now, we can at least focus a little more sharply on what the problem really is. 
as we have repeatedly as we have repeatedly observed inequality is a slippery term so slippery in fact that is that it's not entirely clear what the term egalitarian society should even mean usually it's defined negatively as the absence of hierarchies they believe that certain people of types of people are superior to others or as the absence of relations of dominating of or, or exploitation it is already quite complex and the moment we try to define egalitarianism in positive terms everything becomes much more so on the one hand egalitarianism as opposed to equality let alone uniformity or homogeneity seems to refer to the presence of some kind of ideal it's not just then outside then it, it's not just then outside of several will tend to see all members of, of member to see all members of say a sem a semang hunting party as pretty much interchangeable like the cannon for their minions or some alien overlord in a science fiction movie this world this would in fact be rather offensive but rather that among themselves feel they ought to be the same not in everywhere since that would be ridiculous but in the ways that really matter it also implies that this ideals is largely realist so as so as first approximation we can speak of an egalitarian society if one most people in a given society feel they feel they really ought to be the same in some specific way always that agreed to be particularly important and two that ideal can be said to be largely a shift in practice another way to put this might be as follows if all societies are organized around certain key values wealth pity beauty freedom knowledge warrior prowess then egalitarian societies are those who everyone or almost everyone agrees that the paramount values should be and generally speaking are distributed equally if wealth is what's considered the most important things thing in life then everyone is more or less equally wealthy if learning is most valued then everyone has equal access to knowledge if what's most important is one's relationship with God, then a society is egalitarian if there are no priests and everyone has equal access to place of worship you may have noticed on a, an obvious problem here. Different societies sometimes have radically different systems of value and what might be most important in one or at least what might everyone insist is more important in one might have if very little to do with what's important in another. Imagine a society in which everyone is equal before the, before the gods but 50% of the population are subcovers sub with no property and therefore no legal or political rights. Does it really make sense? Does it really make sense to call this an egalitarian society? Even if everyone, including the subcovers, insists it's really, wa it's really only one's re relation to the gods that is ultimately important there's only one way of this dilemma to create some sort of universal objective standards by which to measure equality since the time of Jane Jacques Rousseau and Adam Smith this has almost invariably meant focusing on property arrangements as we've seen it was only at this point in the mid of in the mid to late 18th century the European philosophers first came up 
with the idea of ranking human societies according to their means of subsistence, and therefore the hunter-gatherers should be treated as a distinct variety of human being. As we've also seen, this idea is very much still with us. But, is so, but, so, but so is Rousseau's argument that it, that it was only the invention of agriculture that introduced genuine inequality since it allowed from the, for the emergence of landed property. This is one of the main reasons people today continue to write as if wagers can be assumed to live in egalitarian bands to begin with because it's also assumed that it Assume that without the productive assets, land, livestock, and stockpile surpluses, grain, wool, dairy products, etc., made possible by farming, there was no real material basis for anyone to load, to load it, to load it over anyone else. Conventional wisdom also tells us. That the, that the moment a material surplus does become possible, there will also be food, there will also be full-time car specialists, warriors, and priests laying claim to it and leaving off some portions of that surplus, or in the case of warriors, spending the bulk of their time trying to figure out the new ways to steal it from each other and never long merchants, lawyers, and politicians will inevitably follow. There's, these new elites will, as Ross emphasis, band together to protect their assets, so the advent of private property will be followed inexorably by the rise of the state. We will scrutinize this conventional wisdom in more detail later. For now, suffice to say that that will there is a broad truth here. It is so broad as to have very little explanatory power for such for sure. All the serial farming and grain storage made the possible bureaucratic regimes like those of Paroni Egypt, the Mori Empire and Han and Han China. But to say that serial farming was responsible for this for the rise of such sites is a little like saying that the development of calculus in medieval Persia is responsible for the invention of the atom, zoo, for the atom bomb. It is, it is true that without calculus, atomic weaponry would never have been possible. One might even make a case that the invention of calculus set off a chain of events that made likely someone, somewhere, would eventually create nuclear weapons, but they said that Althusser's work on polynomials in 1100s caused Hiroshima and Nagasaki is clearly absurd. Similarly with agriculture, roughly 6,000 years stand between, between the appearance of the first farmers in the Middle East and the rise of what we are used to calling the first states and in many parts of the world, farming never led to the emergence of anything remotely like those states. At this juncture, we need to focus we need to focus on the very notion of a surplus and the much broader and most essential cases it raises. As philosophers realized long ago, this is a concept that posed fundamental questions about what it means to be human. One of the things that sets us apart from the human of animals is that animals produce only and exactly what they need what they need. Humans invariably produce more. We are creator, we are creators of excess, and this is what makes us simultaneously the most effective and most destructive of all species. Ruling classes are simply those who have organized society in such a way that they can extract the lion's share of that surplus from themselves whether through tribute, slavery, feudal dues, or manipulative ostensibly free market arrangements. In the 19th century, Marx 
and many of his fellow Gallicas and did imagine that it was possible to administer such a surplus collectively is an equitable fashion. This is what we this is what he envisioned as as being the norm of and the primitive communism and what he thought could could once again be possible in the revolutionary future. But contemporary thinkers tend to be more skeptical. In fact, the nomina the dominant view among anthropologists nowadays is that the only way to maintain a truly egalitarian society is to eliminate the possibility of accumulating any sort of surplus at all. The greatest modern authority on hunter-gatherer egalitarianism is, by general concern, the British anthropologist James Woodburn. In the post-war decades, Woodburn conducted research among the Hadza of a Rajak society of Tanzania. He also drew, he also drew parallels between them and the sun men and booty pygmies as well as a number of other small-scale nomadic forager societies outside Africa, such as the Pandaram of South and the India or Batek, Mal or Batek of Malaysia. Such societies are, what one suggests, the only genuinely egalitarian societies we know of, since they are the only ones the extend equality to gender relations, relations since they are the only ones the extend equality to gender relations and as much as is practicable to relation to relations between old and young. Focusing on such societies a lot would burn to sidestep the question of what is being equalized and what isn't because populations like the hearts appear to apply principles of equality to just about everything it is possible to apply them to, not just material positions, which are constantly being set out or passed around, but have our sacred knowledge, prestige, talented hunters are systematically mocked and belittled, and so on. All such behavior, Woodburn insisted, Woodburn insisted is, based, is based on the self-conscious ethos that no one should ever be in a relation, relation on go, of ongoing dependency to, any, to anybody else. This echoes what we heard in the last chapter from Christopher Baum about the actual real intelligence of egalitarian hunter-gatherers, but Woodburn adds a twist. The real, defining, the real defining feature of such societies is precisely the lack, the, the lack of any material surplus. Truly egalitarian societies for Woodburn are those with immediate return economies. Food brought to harm is eaten the same day or the next. Anything extra is sacked out but never preserved or stored. All this is in stark contrast to both foragers and all pastoralists or farmers who can be categorized as having delayed return economies regularly investing their energies in projects that only bring fruit at some point in the future. Such investments, he argued, he argues, inevitably lead to ongoing tasks that can become the basis for some individual, some individuals to exercise power over others. What's more, Woodburn assumes a certain actuarial intelligence, Hadza, and other egalitarian foragers understand all this perfectly well, and as a result, they self consciously avoid stockpiling resources on engaging in any long term projects. Far focusing blindly for the change like those social pages. Woodburn's immediate return hunter-gatherers understand precisely where the chains of captivity loom and organize much of their lives to keep away from them. This might sound like the basis of something hopeful or optimistic. Actually, it's anything but what is suggests is, again, 
that any equality worth the name is essentially impossible for all but the very simplest voyagers. What kind of future might we then have? What kind of future might we then have in store? At best, we we could perhaps imagine with the invention of Star Trek replicators or other immediate gratification devices that it might be possible at some point in the distant future to create something like a society of, of equals once more but in the meantime we are definitely stuck in order in other words this is the garden of eden narrative all over again just this time with the bark of paradise set even higher what's really striking about woodburn's vision is that the foragers he focuses on appear to have reached such profoundly different conclusions from Kandiarong and several generations of First Nation critics before him, all of whom had trouble had trouble even imagining that differences of wealth could be translated into systematic inequalities of powers. Recall that the Americans in the news critic we described this we describe it in chapter two was in was initially about something very different the perceived value of european societies to promote mutual aid and protect personal liberties one day later only indigenous intellectuals had more exposure to the to the workings of friends and in english society did it come to focus on inequalities of poverty Perhaps we should follow the initial train of thought. Initial train of thought. Few anthropologists are particularly happy with the term egalitarian societies for reasons that should now be obvious, but it but it lingers on because no one has suggested it. Has, but it lingers on because no one has suggested. A compelling alternative. The closest we are aware we are aware of we are aware of is the feminist anthropologist Eleanor Lee Cox's suggestion that most members of what are called egalitarian societies seem less interested in equality per se than what she calls autonomy. What matters to call mountainous Naskapi women? For instance, it's not so much whether men and women are seen to be to be equal of to be of equal status, but whether women are individually or collectively able to live their lives and make their own decisions without male interference. In other words, if there is a fellow this woman feels should be distributed equally. It is precisely what we look, what will, what we would refer to as freedom. Perhaps the best thing then would be to call this free societies, or even following the Jesuit father Lalman's Lalman's verdict on the mountainous Naskapi, where Naskapi surrendered neighbors, free people, each of whom considers himself of as much consequence as the others and they submit to their chiefs only in so far at, as it as it pleases them at, at first glance when that society with its elaborate constitutional structure of chiefs speakers and other office holders might not seem an official choice for inclusion on a list of egalitarian society societies but chiefs are not really chiefs if they have no means to enforce orders equally in societies such as those of when those of the when that was a direct consequence uh, was a direct of consequence of individual liberty of course the same can be said in the reverse liberties are not really liberties if one cannot act on them most people today also believe they live in free societies indeed they often insist that 
politically at least that this is what is important about the societies but the freedoms which form the moral basis of a nation like the unit like the united states are largely formal freedoms americans american citizens have the right to have the right to travel wherever they like provided of course they have the money of our transport and accommodation they are free from ever having to obey the arbitrary orders of superiors should and unless of course they have to get a job in this sense it's almost possible to say the wind that had play shifts and real and real freedoms while most of us today have to make to fit have to make do with real shifts and play freedoms or to put the matter more technically what the hearts are when that or egalitarian people such as the newer seem to have been concerned with where not so much formal freedoms as substantive ones they, they were they were less interested in the right to in the right travel than in the possibility of actual doing so hence the matter was typically framed as an obligation to provide hospitality to strangers mutual aid what contemporary European observers often referred to as communism was seen as the necessity, necessary conditions for individual autonomy. This might help explain at least some of the apparent confusion around the term egalitarianism. It is possible for explicit hierarchies for the marriage, but, not, but to nonetheless remain largely categorical or to confine themselves to very limited aspects of social life. Let us return for a moment to Sunday, Sa Sudanese Newer. Ever since, Dogsport social anthropologist E. E. Evans Pritkart published his classic ethnography on the, of them in the, 1940, in the 1940s, the Newer, the Newer were held out as the very paradigm for egalitarian societies in Africa. They had nothing even remotely resembling institutions for government and were notorious for the high value they, they placed on personal independence. But by the 1960s, feminist anthropologists like Catherine Go were showing that, again, you could really speak of equality of status here males in newer communities were divided between aristocrats with ancestral connections to the territories where they live where they live strangers and lowly were captives and lowly and lowly were captives taken taken by force in raids on other communities neither were there's poorly poorly formal distinctions while even quit cut had with had written off such differences as inconsequential in real in reality as go noted differences difference in rank implied differential access to women only the aristocrats could easily assemble enough cattle to arrange what newer considered as proper marriage that is one in which they could claim paternity over the children and thus be remembered as ancestors after their death. So was Evan Bridgehart simply wrong? Not exactly. In fact, while rank and differential access to cattle became relevant when people were arranging marriages, they had almost no bearing in any other circumstances. It would have been impossible even at a formal event like a dance of sacrifice to determine who was above any or anyone else. Most importantly, differences in wealth cattle never translated into the ability to give orders or to remain formal obeisance. In an often cited passage, Evan Pritkart wrote that everyone who work considers himself as good as his neighbor is evident in their every moment. 
this truth this truth about like laws of the earth which uh, indeed they consider themselves to be there is no master and no serpent in their society but only equals who regard themselves as god noble's creation even the suspicious if even the suspicion of an order of an of an order realize a man and he either does not carry it carry it out or he carries it out in a, in a casual and dilatory manner that is more insulting than a refusal. Evan Spritkat is referring here to men. What about women? While in everyday affairs, go founded women operated with much the same independence as men. The marriage system did efface women's freedom to a degree. If a man paid to if a man paid the forty cattle typically required for a bride's wealth for, for a bride wealth, this man above all that he not only had the had the right to claim paternity over a woman's child children, but also acquired exclusive sexual access, which in which in turn usually meant to right to interfere with his wife's affairs in other respects as well. However, most were most were women were not properly married. In fact, the complexities of the system were such that a large proportion found themselves officially married to God or to other women who could be declared male, who could be declared male for genealogical purposes. In which case, how they went about becoming pregnant and raised their children was nobody's business but their own. Even in sexual life, then, for women as for men, individual freedom was assumed unless there was some specific reason to curtail it. The freedom to abandon the freedom to abandon one's community, knowing one will be welcome in faraway lands, the freedom to shift back and forth between social structures depending on the time of year, the freedom to to this the freedom to disobey authorities without consequence all appear to have been simply assumed among our distant ancestors, even if most people find him barely conceivable today. Humans may not have begun their history in the state of primordial innocence, but they do appear to have begun to have begun it with a self-conscious affection to being to, to being told to being taught what to do. If this is so, we can at least refine our initial question. The real puzzle is not when ships or even king or even kings and queens first appeared, but rather when it was no longer possible simply to love them out of court. Now it is undoubtedly true that over the broad sweep of history, we find even larger and more settled populations, even more powerful forces of production, ever, lang ever larger material surpluses, and people spending ever more of their time under someone else's command. It seems, reason it seems reasonable to conclude there is some sort of connection between these things. But the nature of that connection and the actual mechanisms are entirely unclear. In contemporary societies, we consider ourselves free, free people largely because we lack po we lack political overlords. For for us, it's simply assumed that what we call the economy is organized entirely differently on the basis on the bus not of freedom but efficiency and therefore that offices and shops and soft floors are typically arranged in street chains of command and suffering and surprising then that so much current speculation of the origin of, on the origin of inequality focuses on economic changes and particularly of the words of more of work here to we think much of the available evidence has been widely misconstrued. 
a focus on work is not precisely the same as a focus on poverty. Though, if one is trying to understand how control of property, how control of property first came to be translated into power of command, the world of work will be the viewest place to look. By, the, by framing the stages of human development largely around the way people went about acquiring food, men like Adam Smith and took any death inevitably put work previews considered a somewhat plebeian concern. Center said, There was simple reason of all this. It allowed them to claim that their own societies were self evidently superior, a claim that at the time would have been much harder to defend to defend had their use had the secret criterion other than product productive productive labor. Two God and Smith began writing this <laughs> Two God and Smith began writing this way in seventeen fifties seventeen fifties. They referred to the apex of development as commercial society in which a complex division of labor demand the sacrifice of primitive liberties but guaranteed destiny increases in overall wealth and prosperity. Over the next several decades, the invention of the spinning journey are quite loom and eventually steam and coal power and finally the emergence of a permanent an increasingly self-conscious industrial working class completely shifted the term of debate. Suddenly, there existed forces of production previously undreamed of, but there was also a strange, staggering increase in the number of, how, of hours that people were expected to work in the new mills, 12 to 15 hour days and 60 weeks were considered standard holidays were minimal. John Stuart Mill protested that all the labor saving machinery that has hitherto been invented has not lessened the toil of a single human being. As a result, and over the course of the of the nineteenth century, are most people agreeing about the overall direction of human civilization took it for granted that technological progress was the prime mover of history and that if progress was the story of human liberation this could only mean liberation from unnecessary toil at some future time science will eventually free us from at least the most degrading one was and social destroying from forms of work in fact by the victorian era many began agreeing that this was already happening. Industrialist farming and new labor saving devices, they claim, were already leading us toward a world where everyone would enjoy an existence of leisure and affluence and where we would have to spend most of our working and to spend most of our working life lives running about a what about at someone else's orders. Granted. This must have seemed a bizarre claim to radical trade unionists in Chicago, who, as late as the, the 1880s, had to engage in pitch battles with police and company detectives in order to win an ICRD, that is, obtain the right to a daily war regime that the average medieval baron would have considered unreasonable to expect of themselves. Yet, perhaps as a, as a repose to such campaigns, Victorian, in Victorian intellectuals began agreeing that exactly the opposite was true. Primitive men, they posited, had been engaged, had, be, had been engaged in the, const, in the constant struggle for, for his very existence life in every human society was a perpetual core. European or Chinese or Egyptian peasants toil from, from down till the till dogs to eke out a living and so 
it followed even the awful regimes of the Dickensian age wake up too early in wake up too early an improvement what had come before. All we are doing that all we are going about they insisted the pace of improvement, but the dawn of the twentieth century such reasoning had become universally accepted as common sense. This is what made Marcel Salins' 1968 essay, The Original Affluent Society, such an epochal, ep epochal ep event, and is why, and is why we must now consider both some of its implications and its limitations. Probably the most influential anthropological essay ever writing, ever written, ever written. It turns that all Victorian wisdom still prevalent in the 1960s on its head, creating instant discussion and debate, inspiring everyone from socialists to hippies. Whole, school, whole schools of thought primitivism, the God would likely have never come about without it. But Salins was also writing at a time when archaeological when archaeologists still knew relatively little about pre-agricultural peoples, at least compared to what we know how, at least compared to what we know now, it might be best then first to take a look at his argument before turning to a, to the evidence we have to the we have today and seeing how the peace measures up against it, in which. We discuss Marcel Salin's original affluent society and reflect on what can happen when even a very insightful people read and write about prehistory in the absence of actual evidence. Marcel Salin's started his career in the late 1950s as a neo-evolutionist. When the original affluent society was published, he was still most famous for his work when Elman service which proposed for stages of human political development from bands to tribes, chiefdoms, and states. All these terms are still widely used today. In 1968, Sahlins, Sahlins accepted an invitation to spend a year in Claude Lévi-Strauss laboratory in, in Paris where he later reported he used to eat lunch in the cafeteria each day with peer clusters who, who would go on to write society against the state, arguing about ethnographic data and whether or not society was ripe for evolution. These were heady days in French universities full of student mobilizations and street fighting that ultimately led up to the student or worker institu institution of May 1968, 1968, during which Levi Strauss maintained a healthy neutrality, but Salins and clusters become enthusiastic participants. In the midst of all this political fervor, the natural of work, the need for work, the revision of work, the possibility of gradually emulating work were all heated matters of debates of debate in both political and intellectual cycles. Sahlin says, Sahlin's essay, perhaps the, let, the, the, let, the last truly great example of the genre of speculative prehistory invented by Rousseau, first appeared in Jean Paul Sartre journal Le Thème, Le Thème Moderne. It made, it made the argument that at least when it comes to working to working hours, the Victorian nar narrative of continual improvement is simply backwards. Technological evolution has not liberated people from material necessity. People are not working less. All the evidence, he argued, suggests that over the course of human history, the overall number of hours most people spend working has, ten has tended has then instead to increase. Even more provocatively, Salins insisted that people in earlier ages were not necessarily poorer than modern-day consumers. In fact, 
he contended for much of our early history human humans might just as easily to be might just as easily be said to have lived lives of have lived lives of great material abundance true of a rager might seem extremely pure by our standards but to apply our standards was of usually ridiculous abundance is not an absolute measure it refers to a situation where one has easy access to everything one feels what one feels one needs to live in a happy and comfortable life by by those standards sahlins are good most most known foragers are rich the fact that many hunter gatherers and even hold to equal to rallies only seem to have spent somewhere within two and four hours a day doing anything that could be construed a work was itself proof of how easy their needs to how easy their needs were to satisfy people continuing it's what it's what saying it's what saying that the broad picture sahlins presented appears to be correct as we pointed out above the farage compressed medieval self still work less than a modern 92 925 officer or factory worker and the hazelnut gatherers and cattle herders who drag who drag great slabs to bit stone hedge are most certainly are most certainly work on average less than that it's only very recently it's only very recently that even the richest countries had begun to turn such thing such thing around such things around obviously most of us are not working as many hours as victorian steve dogs though the overall decline in work in working hours is probably not as dramatic as we think and for much of the world's population things are still getting worse instead of better what stands the what stands the test of time less well is the image that most readers take away from Sahlin's essay of happy good lucky hunter gatherers spending most of their time lounging in the shade flirting forming drum cycles or telling stories and this has ha- and this has everything to do with the ethnographic examples he was throwing on last the sun booty and hatsa in the last chapter we suggested a number of reasons why kung san bus men on the margins of the kalahari and hatsa of the serengeti plateau become so popular in the 1960s 1960s as exemplars of what is what of what early human society might have been like despite being despite being quite unusual as foragers go one reason was simply the availability of data of data by 1960s they were among the only foraging populations left who still maintain something like their traditional mode of life it was also in this decade that anthropologists that carrying out time allocation studies recording systematically what rem- what members of different societies do over the course of a typical day and how much time they spend doing it such research with african foragers also seem to resonate with the foremost discoveries of fossil hominins then being made by louis and mary and mary leakey in other parts of the continent such as all dubai jogs gog in tanzania since some of these modern hunter gatherers were living in savannah like environments not unlikely not unlike the ones in which our species now appeared to have evolved it was tempting to imagine that here in these living populations one might catch a glimpse of human society is something like its original state moreover the results of those early time allocation studies came as an enormous surprise it's what wearing on it was it it's what be it's what being wearing in mind that in the post war decades most anthropologists and archaeologists still very much took for granted the old 19th century narrative of humanitarian primordial struggle for existence to our ears 
much of time with to read commonplace at time. Even among the most sophisticated scholars, sounds startlingly condescending, condescending a man who spends his whole life following animals just to kill them to eat. To eat. Wrote the prehistorian Robert Bradwood in, 19, in 1957, or moving from, or moving from one berry patch to another is really living just like an animal himself. Yet this first quantitative, quantitative studies comprehensively disprove such condensements. This thought that even in quite inhospitable environment like the like the desert of Namibia or Botswana, foragers could easily feed everyone in the group and still have three to five days per week left for engaging in such extremely human activities are uh, gossiping, arguing, uh, playing games, dancing, or traveling for pleasures for, for pleasure. Researchers in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties were also beginning to realize that far from agriculture being some sort of remarkable scientific advance, foragers who after all tended to be intimately familiar with all aspects of the growing cycles of food plants were perfectly aware of one of how one might go about planting and harvesting grains and vegetables. They just didn't see any reason why why they should. Why should we plant one? Kung informant put it in a press cited ever since in the in the thousand thirties on the origins of farming when they are when there are so many mongongo nuts in the world in the world indeed on concluding concluded sahlins what some what some prehistorians had assumed to be technical ignorance was really of a self-conscious social decision such foragers had rejected the neolithic revolution in order to keep their their leisure anthropologists were still struggling to come to terms with all this when sahlins step in to draw the larger conclusions. The ancient forager ethos of leisure, the same road to affluence, only broke down. Also Sahlin's surmise, when people finally, for whatever reasons, began to settle in one place and accept the toils of agriculture, they did so at a, at a terrible cost. It was just ever increasing hours, hours of toil that fall about that followed, but for most poverty, disease, work and slavery, all fooled by the endless competition and the mindless pursuit of new pleasures, new powers, and new form of wealth. With one death morph, Sahlin's original affluent society used the results used the results of time allocation studied studies to pull the rock from under the, the, the traditional story of human civilization. Like Wood, Woodburn, Sahlin's push aside was so version of the fall, the idea that to fool is to reflect on the likely consequences of our actions in assembling, stockpiling and guarding proper, property. We ran blindly for our chains and takes, uh, and takes us straight back to the Garden of Eden. If rejecting farming was a conscious choice, then so was that act of embracing it. We, we chose to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge, and for this we, and for this we were punished. As Saint Augustine put it, we rebelled against God, and God's judgment was to cause our own desires to rebel against our rational good sense. Our punishment for original sin is the infinity of our new desires. If there is a fundamental difference here from the biblical story, it's that the fall, according to Salins, did happen, didn't happen just once. We did collapse and then begin slowly to pull ourselves back up. When it comes to labor and, and affluence, every new technological breakthrough seem seems to cause us to fall yet further. Sahlin's piece is a brilliant morality tale. There is, however, one obvious flaw 
the whole argument for an origin of fluent society rested on single fragile premise that most prehistoric humans really did li really did live in the specific manner of African foragers. As Sahlins was perfectly willing to admit this was so just a guess. In closing his essay, he asked whether marginal hunters such as the Bushmen of the Kalahari really were any more representative of the Paleolithic condition than the foragers of California who placed great value on hard work of the Northwest Coast with the ring societies as top parts of wealth. Perhaps, perhaps not, Sahlin conceded. This This often of a glue observation is crucial. It's not that Sahlin is suggesting that his own phrase, original affluent society, is incorrect. Rather, he acknowledges that, just as there might have been many ways for free peoples to be free, there might have been more than just one way from or for original affluent societies to be affluent. Not all modern hunter-gatherers value research of hard work, just as not all serve the easy-going easy attitudes towards personal possessions of the king of Hatsa. Foragers in northwestern California, for instance, we not were notorious for their incupidity, organizing much of their lives around the accumulation of cell money and sacred treasures and adhering to a state work ethic in order to do so. The fish of foragers of the Canadian Northwest Coast, on the other hand, live in highly stratified societies where commoners and slaves were famously in industrious. According to one of their endographers, the Quakule of Vancouver Island were not only well housed and fed, but lavishly supplied. Each household made and possessed many mats, boxes, cheddar bark, and fur blankets, wooden dishes, horn spoons, and canoes. It was as though in, in manufacturing as well as in food for production, there was no point at which further expenditure of effort in the production of more of the same items was felt to be superfluous. Not only did the quad kills surround themselves with endless piles of possessions, but they also put endless creativity into designing and crafting them, with results so striking and int intricately beautiful as to make them the pride of ethnographic museums the world, the world over. Levi Strauss remarked that turn of the century, Quarkyut were like a society where dozen different Picassos were operative all at the same time. This, surely, is a kind of affluence, but one entirely different from that of the Kung Ombuti, which then more resembled the original state of human affairs, the easy-going Hadza, of the industrious foragers of Northwestern California by now. It will be clear to the reader that this is just the kind of question we shouldn't be asking. There was no truly original state of affairs. Any anyone who insists that no one exists is by definition trading in myths, silence at least, were fairly honest about this. Human beings had many tens of thousands of years to experiment with different ways of life, long before any of them turned their, their hands out to agriculture. Instead, we might do better to look at the overall direction of change so as to understand how it bears on our question, how humans came largely to lose the flexibility and freedom that seems once to have characterized social arrangements and ended up stuck in permanent relations of dominance and subordination. To do this, to to do this, to do this means continuing the story begun in chapter three, following our foraging ancestors out of the ice age of our Pleistocene era into a phase of warmer global climate known as the Holo Holocene. This will also take us for far outside Europe. 
to places like Japan and the Caribbean coast of North America were entirely new and suspected paths are beginning to emerge once which despite the stubborn efforts of scholars to so hone them into neat revolutionary boxes look about as far from small nomadic egalitarian bands as one can possibly imagine in which we saw how new discoveries concerning asian hunter gatherers in north america and japan are turning social evolution on its head in modern day louisiana the in modern day louisiana there is a place with the dispiriting dis 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 name of Pover poverty point here you can still see the remains of massive networks erected by native americans around 1800 bc 1600 bc when it plus green low loan and well-trained copy case today the site looks like something halfway between a wildlife management area and a golf club grass covered mounds and rich rice neatly from carefully tended meadows forming concentric rings we suddenly vanish where where the bayou Macon has, has eroded them away. Bayou mean the reef via Luciana friends. From the cocktail word bayou, massy refuelets spreading out from the main channel of the Mississippi. Despite Natur's the despite Natur's best efforts to build, to obliterate this it works and early European settlers best efforts to deny the, the obvious significance. Perhaps these were the dwellings of an ancient race of giants, the conjecture or one of the lost tribes of Israel, the endure evidence for an ancient civilization of the lower Mississippi and testimony to the scale of its accomplishment. According archaeologists believe this structures up at poverty point form an, a monumental precinct, precinct that once extended over 200 hectares, flanked by two enormous ethan, ethan mounds, the, the so called Motley and Lower Jackson mounds, which lie respectively north and south. To clarify what this means, it's worth noting that the first Eurasian cities is centers of the civic like. The civic life like Uru in, Uru in southern Iraq or Harappa in the Punjab began a settlements of roughly 200 hectares in total, which is to say that the entire layout could fit quite comfortably within the ceremonial passing of poverty point. Like those early Russian cities, poverty point sprang from a, from a great, city, great river since transport by water, particularly of bulk goods, was in early times infinitely easier than transport by land. Like them, it formed the core of a much larger sphere, sphere of, of cultural interaction. People and resources came to poverty point from hundreds of miles away, of as far north as the Great Lakes and from the Gulf of Mexico to the south. Seen from the air, a guts a few poverty points ten degree remains look like sun, some sunken gargantuan amphitheater, a place of crowds and parks and, and power worthy of any great agrarian civilization. Something approaching a million cubic meters of soil of soil was moved to create its ceremonial infrastructure, which was not likely oriented to the skies, since some of its mounds from enormous figures of it for birds, inviting the heavens to bear witness to their presence. But the people of poverty point weren't farmers, nor did they use the right thing. They were hunters, fishers, and foragers, exploiting a subabundance of wild resources, fish, deer, nuts, waterfall in the lower reaches of the Mississippi, and they were not the first hunter-gatherers in this region 
to establish traditions of public architecture. These traditions can be traced back far beyond poverty point itself to around 1500 BC, which is also roughly the time that cities first emerged in Eurasia. An archaeologist often point out, poverty point is a stone egg in is a stone egg site in an area where there is no stone. So the staggering quantifies of lithic tools, weapons, vessels, and lapidary ornaments found there must all have been originally carried from somewhere else. The scale of its works implies thousands of people gathering at the site at particular times of year in number outstriping any historically known hunter-gatherer population. Much less clear is what attracted them, them there with their native copper, flint, quartz, crystal, soapstone, and other minerals, or how often they came and how long they stayed. We simply do not, they simply don't know. What we do know is that poverty point arouse and split hairs, and spare heads come in rich hoods of red, black, yellow, and even blue stone, and these are only the colors of the sun. Ancient classifications were no doubt more refined. If stones were being selected with such care, we can only begin to imagine what was going with cords, fibers, medicines, and any living thing in the landscape treated as, a, as potential food or potion, another thing we can be quite sure of it, another thing we can quite sure of is that dread is not useful way to describe whatever was going on here. For one thing, dread goes to waste, and poverty point presents no clear evidence for exports or indeed commodities of any sort. The absence is strikingly, is strikingly obvious to anyone who studies who study in the, the remains of early Russian cities like the like Uruk and Harappa, why which to seem which, which to seem to have been engaged in live lively tra trade relations, these cities are awash with industrial quantita quantities of ceramic of ceramic packaging and the products of the urban crafts are found far and wide. Despite its great cultural reach, there is nothing at all of this commodity culture at poverty point. In fact, it's not clear if anything much going much must go much much going out from the set, at least in material terms, other than certain enig enigmatically items known as cooking balls, which can hardly be considered trade goods. Textiles and fabrics may have been important, but we also have to allow the po for the possibility that poverty points greatest assets were intangible. Most experts today, most expert today view its monuments as expression of, of sacred geometry, link, link to calendar counts and the movement of celestial bodies. If anything was being stockpiled at poverty point, it may well have been knowledge, the intellectual property of rituals, vision, quests, songs, dances, and images. We can possibly know the details, but it's more than just speculation to say that ancient foragers were exchanging complex information across, its, it, across this entire region and in, highly, in, and in a highly controlled fashion. Material proof comes from close examination of the earthen monuments themselves. Through the great valley of the Mississippi and some considerable work way beyond, there exist other small sites of the same period. The various configuration of their mounds and ridges adhere to strictly uniform geometrical principles based on standard units of measurement and proportion apparently shared by early peoples throughout a significant portion of the Americas. 
the underlying system of calculus appears to have been based on the transformational properties of equilateral triangles figured out with the aid of cords and strings that they extended to the laying out of massive earthworks. Published in, in 2004, this remarkable discovery by John E. Clark, an archaeologist and authority on the pre-Columbian societies of Mesoamerica, has been greeted by the, so by the scholarly community with responses ranging from lukewarm acceptance to plain disbelief, although nobody appears to have actually refuted it. Many people simply to ignore it. Clark himself seems surprised by his results. We will return to some wider implications in Chapter 11, but for now we can simply note an assessment of Clark's findings by two specialists in the field who accept the evidence he presents not only for a standard unit of measurement but also geometrical layouts and spacing intervals among first mound complexes from Louisiana to Mexico and Peru, which incorporate multiplies of that standard. At most, finding the same system of measurement across such distances may prove to be one of contemporary archaeologists' archaeology most provocative revelations. And at the very least, they conclude those who built the works were not simple, ordinary foragers. Putting aside, but putting aside the by no irrelevant notion that there were there ever there ever was such a thing as simple ordinary voyagers, it has to be said that even if Clark, Clark's theory were true only for the lower only for the lower Mississippi and the surrounding parts of the eastern woodlands, it would still be quite remarkable for unless we are dealing with some kind of amazing cosmic coincidence. It means that someone had to convey knowledge of the geometry and, mat geometry and mathematical techniques for, for making accurate special measurements in related forms of global organization over very long distances. If this were the case, it seems likely that they also shared other forms of knowledge of, as well cosmology, geology, philosophy, medicines, medicine, ethics, fauna, flora, ideas about poverty, social structure, and aesthetics. In the case of poverty point, should this be con conceived as a form of exchange of knowledge for material goods? Possibly. But the measurement, but the movement of objects and ideas might have been organized in a number of other ways as well. All we know for, uh, for sure is that the lack of an agriculture base does not seem to have stopped those who get on poverty point for creating something that to us would appear very much like little cities, like little cities which, at least during certain times of year, hosted a rich and influential intellectual life. Today, Poverty Point is a national park and monument of an UNESCO World Heritage Site. Despite these designations of inter international importance, its implications for world history have hardly begun to be explored. A hunter-gatherer metropolis the size of a Mesopotamian city-state Poverty Point makes the Anatolian complex of Gobekli look like, Tepe look like little more than Port Belly Hill, which is in fact what Gobekli Tepe means in Turkey. Which is in fact what Gobekli Tepe in, means in Turkey. Yet outside a small community of academic specialists and of course local res residents and visitors, very few people have heard of it. The obvious question at this chunker must surely be, why isn't Poverty Point better now to our audiences the world over? Why doesn't it feature more prominently or at all, or at all in discussions or on the origins of urban, li of urban life, centralization, 
and the consequences for human history. One reason, no doubt, is the poverty point and its predecessors, like the much more like the much older Mount Complex at Watson's Break in the nearby Wachita Basin, have been placed in the face of American prehistory known as the Archaic. The Archaic period con covers an immense span of time between the flooding of the Beringia Land, Beringia Land Bridge, which once linked Eurasia to the Americas around 8000 BC, and the initial adoption and spread of mass farming in the certain parts of North America down to around 1000 BC. One word for seven millennia of indigenous, indigenous history. Archaeologists who first gave the period its name which is really more of a chronological slap in, in the face, where basically declaring this is the period before anything particularly important was happening. So when unenable evidence began to appear that all sorts of important things were indeed happening and not just in the Mississippi Basin, it was almost something of an archaeological embarrassment. On the shores of the Atlantic and around the Gulf of Mexico lie enigmatic structures just as remarkable as poverty point but even less well known. Formed out of certain great accumulations, they range from small rings to massive Yusef and Pediatrics like those of St. John's River Valley in Northeast Florida. These were natural features. They to work built spaces where hunter gatherer publics once assembled in their thousands. Far to the north and west, on the other side of the continent, more surprises loom up from the wind swept shores of British Columbia, settlements and forti fortifications of striking magnitude dating back as far as 2000 BC facing a Pacific really familiar with the spectacle of war and long-range bombers. On the matter of hunter gatherer history, North America isn't the only part of the world where evolutionary expectations are heading for a titanic collision with the archaeological record in Japan and neighboring islands. Um, another monolithic cultural destination, Jomon, Holds way over more than 10,000 years of voyagers of, of, of voyager history for around 40,000 BC to 300 BC. Japanese archaeologists spend much time subdividing the German period in ways just as intricate as the more, as the more pioneering North American scholars now do with the archaic. Everyone else, however, whether museum goes or readers of high school textbooks is still confronted with the stark singularity of the of the term Jomon, which covering the long ages before rice farming came to Japan, leaves us with an impression of grab conservatism, a time when nothing really happened. New archaeological discoveries are now revealing just how wrong this is. The creation of a new Japanese national past is a somewhat paradoxical side effect of modernization. Since Japan economic takeoff in the 1960s, many thousands of archaeological sites have been discovered, excavated, and, and meticulously and meticulously recorded, either as a result of construction projects of roads, railways, housing, and nuclear plants, or as part of immense re rescues, rescue efforts and the ticket in the way of environmental catastrophes, such as the 12, 2011 Tohoku earthquake. The result is an immense archive of archaeological information. What begins to emerge from this data labyrinth is an entirely different picture 
of what society was like before irrigated rice cultivation which came to Japan from the Korean Peninsula. Across the Japanese archipelago between, between 14,300 cc centennial cycles of settlement nucleation and dispersal came and went, monuments set up in wood and stone and then were pulled down again or abandoned elaborate ritual traditions including opulent burials, flourish and decline, specialist craft, spe specialist craft works and one, including remarkable accomplishments in the arts of pottery, wood and lacquer. In traditions of wild wood, in traditions of wild food procurement, strong regional contrasts are evident ranging from maritime adaptations to a con based economy to a con based economies but both use both using large storage facilities for gated resources. Cannabis came into use for fibers and recreational drug store drug use. There were enormous villages with grand store houses and what seemed to be ritual precincts such as those found at Sanai Maruyama, an entire forgotten social history of pre-agricultural Japan is resurfacing. For now, largely a mass as a mass data, as a mass of data points and state heritage archives. In future, as the bits get pieces get pieced back together, who was who knows what will come into view. Europe too bears witnesses. We, Europe too bears witness to the vibrant and complex history of non-agricultural peoples after the Ice Age. Take the monuments called in Finnish Jatinkirko, the giant churches of the body of the Botnian Sea between Sweden and Finland, great stone, great stone ramparts. Some up to 195 feet long, raised up in their tents by coastal voyagers between 3000 and 2000 BC. Or the big idol, a 17 foot tall totem pole with, a, with elaborate carvings rescued from a pit, a pit box on the shores of Lake Sigirsko on the eastern slopes at the central. At the central Urals, dating around to 8000 BC, the idol is the is the lone survivor of a long lost tradition of line, of large scale wooden forager art, which once produced monuments that presided over northern skies. Then come the amber soak burials of Karelia and southern Scandinavia with the elaborate grave food goods and cup staged stage in expressive poses, echoing some forgotten etiquette of Mesolithic vintage. And as we've seen, even the major, even the major building faces of Stonehenge, long associated with early farmers, are now dated to a time when cereal cultivation was virtually abandoned with enhancing gathering once and Hesena gathering once again took over in the British Islands alongside livestock herding. Back in North America, some researchers are beginning to talk a little awkwardly of the new archaic hitherto unsuspected era of monuments without kings. But the truth is, but the truth is that we still know precious little of the political systems lying behind a now almost globally attested phenomenon of forager monumentality. Or indeed, whether some of those monuments, monumental projects might have involved kings or other kinds of leaders. What we do, what we do know, what we do know is that this changes. Forever, the narrative of the conservation about social evolution in the Americas, Japan, 
Yugo and no doubt most other places too. Clearly, Voyagers didn't solve all big mistakes at the close of the last ice age, waiting in the wings of for some group of Neolithic farmers to reopen the theater of history. Why then is this new knowledge so rarely integrated in, into our accounts of, of the human past? Why does almost everyone, everyone at least, who is not a species in archaic Northwest America of Jomon, Japan, still write as if such things were impossible before the coming of agriculture? Of course, those of us with no access to archaeological reports can be executed, excused. What information exists more widely tends to be restricted to to scattered and sometimes sensationalist news summarized that are very hard to put together into a single picture. Scholars and professional researchers, on the other hand, have to actually make a considerable effort to remain so ignorant. Let us consider for a moment some of the peculiar forms of intellectual acrobatics required. How the myth that foragers live in a state of infantile simplicity is kept alive today, is kept alive today, or informal fallacies. For, let first ask why even some experts apparently find it so difficult to shake off the idea of carefree idol forager band and the twin assumption that civilization properly so called towns, specialist craft people, specialists in esoteric knowledge will be impossible without agriculture. Why would anyone continue to write history as if place, places like Poverty Point could never have, be, have existed? It can just be the whimsical result of every academic terminologies, archaic, German, and so on. The real answer, we suggest, has more to do with the legacy of European colonial expansion and in particular its impact on both indigenous, indigenous and European systems of thought, especially with regard to the expression of rights and po or poverty in land. Recall how long before Sahlin's notion of the origin of poor society, indigenous critics of Europe of European civilization well already agreeing that hunter-gatherers were really better off than other people because they could obtain the things we wanted and needed, and needed so easily, such fields can be found as early as the existing century. Remember, for instance, the Mi'kmaq interlocutors who annoying Hanoi Perbiar so much by insisting they by, by insisting they were richer than the French for exactly that reason, Kanyaro made similar arguments, insisting the savages of Canada, notwithstanding their poverty, are richer than you, among whom all sorts of crimes are committed upon the so score of mind and time. As we've seen, indigenous critics like Kanyaro, caught in the rhetorical monument, who frequently, who frequently overstate their case, even playing along with the idea that they were blissful, innocent children of the nature. They did this in order to expose what they considered the bizarre perversions of the European lifestyle. The irony is that, in doing so, they often played into the hands of those who are good that, being blissful, innocent children of nature, they also had no natural rights to their land. Here, is, here it's important to understand a little of the legal basis of the dispossessing people who had the misfortune already to be living in territories coveted by European settlers. This was almost invariably what 19th century jurists came to call the agricultural argument, a principle which has played a major role in the in the dis dipl displacement of untold thousands of indigenous people peoples from ancestral ancestral lands in Australia, New Zealand, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
and the Americans and the Americas. Proce process typically accompanied by the rape, torture, and mass murder of human beings, of often the, of the and often the destruction of entire civilization. Colonial appropriation of indigenous lands often began with some blanket assertion that foraging peoples really were living in a state of nature, which meant that they were deemed to be part of the land but had no legal claims to out it. The entire basis for this position, in turn, was, pre was premised on the idea that the current inhabitants of those lands weren't really working. The argument goes back to John Locke, John Locke's second treatise of government, 1690, in which he argued that property rights are necessarily derived from labor in working the land. One, my, one mixes one's labor with it. In this way, it becomes, in a sense, an extension of oneself. Lazy natives. According to Locke's disciples, didn't do that. They were not Lockeans claimed improving landlords, but simply made use of the land to satisfy their basic needs with the minimum of effort. James Dooley, an authority on indigenous rights, spells out the historical implications. Land used for, used for hunting and gathering was considered vacant. And if the Aboriginal peoples attempt to subject the Europeans to their laws and customs or to defend the territories that they have mistakenly believed to be their property for thousands of years, then it is they who violate natural law and may be punished or destroyed like the savage beasts. In a similar way, the stereotype of the carefree, lazy native costing too a life free from material ambition, was deployed by thousands of European conquerors, plantation overseers, and colonial officials in Africa, Asia, America, colonial officials in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and Oceania as pretext for the use of the bureaucratic terror to force local people into work everything from outright enslavement to punitive tax regimes, cough, labor, and debt peonage. As indigenous legal scholars have been pointing out for years, the agricultural argument makes no sense, even on its own terms. There are many ways, other than European-style farming, in which to care, to care for and improve the productivity of land. What to a setter's eyes, what to a setter eye seems savage, and touch wilderness usually turns out to be landscape actively managed by indigenous population populations for thousands of years to control burning, weeding, coppicing, fertilizing and pruning, terracing estuarine plots to extend the habitat of particular white flora, building climb gardens in intertidal zones to enhance the reproduction of shellfish, creating whales to catch salmon, bass, sturgeon, and so on. Such procedures were often labor-intensive and regulated by indigenous laws governing who could access groves, swamps, root beds, grasslands, and fishing grounds, and who was entitled to exploit what, is, what species at any given time of year. In part of Australia, these indigenous techniques of land management were such that, according to one recent study, we should stop speaking for, for foraging altogether and refer instead to a difficult sort of farming. Such societies might not have recognized, recognized, private, property, recognized private property rights in the same sense as Roman law or English common law, but it's absurd to argue that to argue they had no property rights at all. They simply had different conceptions of property. This is true, incidentally, even of people like the Hatsa or Kung. And as, as we will see, many other foraging peoples actually had extraordinarily, had extraordinarily complex and sophisticated conceptions of ownership. 
Sometimes these indigenous property systems form the basis for differential access to resources with the result that something like social crisis emerged. Usually, too, this did not, not, this did not happen because people made sure that it didn't, much as they say Monsieur Chiefs did not develop coercive people, coercive power. We should nonetheless recognize that the economic base at the economic base at the least of at least some foraging societies was capable of supporting anything for completely castes to royal cards with standing armies. Let us take jump. Let us take just one dramatic example to illustrate the point. One of the first North Americas uh, North American societies societies described by European explorers in the 16th century were the Kalusa and non-agricultural people who inhabited the west coast of Florida from Tampa Bay to the Keys. There, they had established a small kingdom ruled from a capital town called Kalos, which today is marked by a 30-hectare complex of high cell mounds known as Monkey. Fish, shellfish, and larger marine animals comprise a major, fact, a major part of the Kalusa diet supplemented by deer, raccoon, and a variety of birds. Kalusa also maintain a feed a way of work kind of, with which with which they would launch military raids on nearby populations, extracting processed, processed foods, skins, weapons, amber, metals, and slaves as tribute. When Juan Ponce de Leon entered Carlot Harbor on for June 1513, he was met by a by a well-organized flotilla of Saskanos manned by heavily armed hunter-gatherers. Some historians resist calling the Kalusa leader a king, preferring terms like Paramount Chiefs, uh, like Paramount Chief, but first-hand accounts leave no doubt about his exalted status. The man known as Carlos, the ruler of Carlos, at the time of initial European contact, even looked like a European king. He wore a gold diadem and beaded leg and beaded leg bands and sat on wooden throne and cushy cushy He was the only Kalusa allowed to do so. His power seemed absolute. His will was law, and in and in subordination was punishable by death. He was also responsible for for performing secret rituals that ensured the renewal of net renewal of nature. His subjects always greeted him by kneeling and raising their hands in a gesture of ob obeisance, and he was typically accompanied by representatives of the ruling class, of warrior nobles and priests, who like him devoted themselves largely to the business of government, and he had at, dispos and he had at his disposal the services of specialist craftsmen, including court metallurgists who work silver, gold, and copper. Spanish observers reported a traditional practice that on the death of a Calusa ruler or of his principal wife, a certain quota of their subjects, sons, and daughters had to be put to death. By most definitions, all this world, all this would make Carlos not just a king, but a sacred king, perhaps divine. We know less about the economic basis for these arrangements, but court life appears to have been made possible not only by complex systems, by complex systems of access to coastal fishing grounds, which were exceedingly rich, but also by canals and artificial ponds dug out of the coastal everglades. The latter, in turn, allowed for permanent, that is, transitional settlements. Two Moscalusa did still scatter to fishing and gathering sites at certain times of year when the big when the big towns grew decidedly smaller. By all accounts, then the Kalusa had indeed got stuck in a single economic and political mode that allowed extreme forms of inequality to emerge, but they did so without ever planting a single seed of tethering a single animal. Confronted with such cases, 
at the rents of the few that agriculture was a, was a necessary foundation for durable inequalities have two options, ignore them or claim they represent some kind of insignificant anomaly. Surely, they will say, for ragers who do these kinds of things, raiding their, their neighbors, stockpiling wealth, creating elaborate court ceremonial, defending their territories and so on, aren't really foragers at all, or at least, or at least not true foragers. Surely, they must be farmers by other means, effectively practicing agriculture, just with will, just with wild cops, or perhaps somehow caught in a moment of transition on the mo on the way to becoming to becoming farmers, just not yet having quite arrived. All these are excellent examples of what Anthony Flew called the no true Scotsman, no true Scots Scotsman style of argument, also known to logicians as the ad hoc rescue, ad hoc rescue procedure. For those unfamiliar with it, it works like this. Imagine Hamis MacDonald, a Scotsman, sitting down with his Glasgow Morning Herald and seeing an article about how the Britain sex maniac strikes again. Hamis is shocked and declares that no Scotsman would do such a thing. The next day, he sits down and to, he sits down to read his Glasgow Morning Herald again, and this and this time finds an article about an Aberdeen, an Aberdeen man whose brutal actions make the Brighton sex maniac seem almost gentlemanly. This fact shows that Hamish was wrong in his opinion, but he is going to admit this. Not likely. This time he says. No true Scotsman would do such a thing. Philosophers frown on this style of, argument of, of argumentation as a classic informal fallacy of variety of secular argument. You simply assert a proposition. Hunter-gatherers, e.g., hunter-gatherers do not have aristocracies, then protect it from any possible counter examples by continually changing the definition we prefer a consistent approach. Foragers are populations. Foragers are population which don't rely on biologically domesticated plants and animals as their primary sources of food. Therefore, if it becomes apparent that a good number of, the, of them have in fact possessed complex systems of land tenure or worship kings or practice slavery, this altered picture of the activities does not some doesn't somehow magically turn them into proto farmers, nor does it justify the invention of endless subcategories like complex or affluent or delayed return hunter gatherers, which is simply another way of ensuring such peoples are kept in what the Haitian anthropologist Mitchell Roth to to Trilot called the service lot their histories defined and circumscribed by their mode of subsistence, as if there were people who really ought to be lazing around the all day, but for some reason got ahead of themselves. Instead, it means that the, the initial existence was, like that of the apocryphal Hamish MacDonald, simply wrong. In which we dispose of one particular single argument that foragers who settle in the in territories that lend themselves well to foraging as foraging are somehow unusual. In academic truth, in academic thought, there's another popular way of propping up the myth of agricultural revolution and thereby writing off people like the Kalusa as evolutionary quicks or anomalies. This is to claim that they only behave the way they did because they will they were living in atypical environments. Usually what's meant by atypical are wetlands of various sorts, coasts and river valleys, as opposed to the remote remote corners of tropical forests or desert margins, which is assumed to be where hunter gatherers really ought to be living since 
that is where most of them live today. This it is a particularly wet argument, but a lot of very serious people make it, so we'll briefly have to stake it on. Anyone who was still living mainly by hunting animals and gathering wild foodstuffs in the early to mid 20th century was almost certainly living on land no one else particularly wanted. That's why so many of the best descriptions of foragers come from places like the Kalahari Desert of Arctic Cycle. 10,000 years ago, this was obviously not the case. Everyone was a forager, overall population densities were low. Foragers were therefore free to live in pretty much any sort of territory they fancied. All things being equal, those living of wild resources would tend to cleave to places where they were abandoned. You will you will think this is self evident, but apparently it is it, it it isn't. Those who today describe people like the Kalusa as typical as a t as a typical because they had such a prosperous resource base won't was want to uh, want us to believe instead that ancient foragers choose to avoid locations of this kind sending of the rivers and coast which also offered a natural activist for movement and communication because they were so keen to oblige later researchers by assembling 20th century hunter-gatherers, the sort for which which detailed scientific data is available today. We are asked to believe that it was only after they ran out of the sets and mountains and rainforests that they reluctantly started the colonies richer and more comforted environments. We might call this the all the bad spots are taken argument. In fact, there was nothing atypical about Kalusa. They were just one of many fisher forager populations living around the states of Florida, including the Tequesta, Pujoy, Jiaga, Jobe, and Ice, some apparently ruled by the dynasties of, by the, by dynasties of their own, with whom Kalusa conducted regular trade for wars and arranged dynasties marriages. They were also among the first Native American societies to be destroyed since, for a few reasons, cause and estuaries were the first, the first spots where Spanish colonizers landed, bringing epidemic diseases, priests, tribute, and inventory setters. This was a pattern repeated on the on every continent from America to Oceania were invariably the most attractive ports, harbors, fisheries, and surrounding lands were first snapped by, by British, French, Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch of Russian settlers, who also drained, also drained tidal salt marshes and coastal lagoons for farm cereals and cash crops. Such was the fate of the Calusa and the ancient fishing and hunting grounds. When Florida was ceded to the British in the mid in the mid 18th century, the last handful of surviving of subjects from the Kingdom of Calos were, were shipped off to, Car to the Caribbean by the Spanish masters. By most of, hunt of human history, fishers, hunters, and foragers did not have to contend with expansive empires, therefore they themselves tended to be the most active human colonizers of aquatic environments. Archaeological evidence increasingly bears this out. It was long thought, for instance, that the Americas were first settled, were, were first settled by humans traveling main, mainly over land, the so-called Clovis people. Around 30,000 years ago, they were supposed to have followed 
and are those confessing from Beringia, the land bridge between Russia and Alaska, passing south between terrestrial glaciers of a frozen mountains. All because, for some reason, it never occurred to any of them to beat a boat and follow the coast. Most recent evidence suggests a very different picture, or as one Navajo informant, or as one Navajo informant put it when faced with an archaeological map of the terrestrial route with Be via Beringia, maybe some other guys came out, came over like that, but as Navajos came a different way. In fact, Eurasian populations made a much earlier entry to what to what was then a genuinely new world some 17 years, or years ago. What was more, they did indeed thing to beat boats to beat boats, following a coastal route that, that passed around the Pacific Rim, hoping between offshore islands and linear patches of camp forest and ending some work on the southern coast of China. Early as what crossings also took place. Of course, it's possible that these first Americans, on arriving in such rich coastal habitats, quickly abandoned them, preferring for some, uh, some uh, obscure reason to spend the rest of their lives climbing mountains hacking their way through forests and dragging across endless monotonous, monotonous prairies. But it seems more plausible to assume that the bulk of them stayed exactly where they were, often forming dense and stable settlements in such locations. The problem is, until recently, this has always been an argument from silence, since Rising since rising sea levels long ago submerged the earliest records of shoreline habitation in most parts of the world. Archaeologists have tended to resist the conclusion that such habitations must have existed despite the lack of physical remains, but with advantage, but with advantage, advance. In the investigation of underwater environments, the case is going stronger. A distinct soldier, but also frankly more common, commonsensical, account of early human dispersal and settlement is finally become possible. In which we finally return to the question of, of, of property and inquire as to its relation to the second. All this means that of the many dis distinct cultural universes beginning to take shape across the world in the early Holocene, but most were likely centered on environments of abundance rather than scarcity, more like, that, more like the Kalusas than the Kungs. Thus, this also mean they were likely to have similar, similar political arrangement to the Kalusa. Her some, caution, her some caution is in order that the Kalusa managed to maintain a sufficient economic surplus to support what looks to us like a miniature kingdom, like a miniature kingdom, does not mean such an outcome is inevitable as soon as a society is capable of stopping a sub sufficient quantity of fish. After all, the Kalusa were suffering people, they would have undoubtedly been familiar with kingdoms ruled by divine monarchs like the great son of the Nazis in nearby Luciana, and likely as not the empires of Central America. It's possible they were simply imitating more powerful neighbors, or may they were just odd, finally they would on. Finally, we don't really know how much power even a divine king like Carlos really had. Here, it's useful to consider the Natchez themselves. An agricultural cop much better document than the Calusa with a spectacular and purportedly, 
purportedly absolute monarch of their own. The Nazi son, as the monarch, was known inhabited a village in which he appeared to wield unlimited power. His every movement was greeted by elaborate rituals of deference, bowing and scraping. He could order arbitrary executions, help himself to any of his subjects' positions, do pretty much anything he liked. Still, this power was strictly limited by his own physical presence, which in turn was largely confined to the royal village or itself. Most Nazis did not grave in the royal village, indeed, most tended to avoid the place for obvious reasons. Outside it, royal representatives were treated no more seriously than Montanist Nazi chiefs. If subjects were inclined but to obey these representatives' orders, they simply looked at them. In other words, while the court of the Nazi son was not pure empty theater, those executed by the great son were most definitely dead, neither was it the court of Suleiman, the magnificent of Aurangzeb. It seems to have been something almost precisely in between. Was Kalusa kingship in Asim was Kalusa kingship a similar arrangement? Spanish observers clearly did that didn't think so. They regarded it as a more or less absolute monarchy. But since typically half the point of such the literatrix is to impress the outsiders, that tells us very little in itself. What have we learned for so far? Most obviously that we can now put a final nail to the in the coffin of the prevailing view that human beings live more or less like Kalahari was men, until the invention of agriculture sent everything askew. Even where even were it possible to ride to ride off place to send Mahmoud Mahmoud gun hunters as some kind of strange anomaly, the same clearly cannot be said for the period that immediately followed by glaciers retreat retreat when dozens of new societies began to form along resource-rich coast estuaries and river valleys, creating in large and often permanent settlements, creating entirely new industries, building monuments according to mathematical principles, developing regional systems, and so on. We have also learned that, at least, some of the societies developed a material infrastructure capable of supporting royal courts and standing armies, even though we have as yet no clear evidence that they actually did so. To construct the networks of poverty point, for instance, must have taken enormous amount amounts of human labors of human labor and a strict regime of carefully planned out work. But we, but we still have little idea how that labor was organized. Japanese archaeologists surveying dozens of gears wrought of German sites have discovered all sorts of treasures, but they are yet to find this indisputable evidence that those treasures were monopolized by any sort of aristocracy or, rule, or ruling elite. We cannot possibly know exactly which forms of ownership existed in these societies. What we can suggest, and there's plenty of evidence to support it, is that all the places in question, poverty point, Sanai Maruyama, the Castelli Giants Church in, Vin in Finland, or indeed the early resting places of Upper Paleolithic Grandis, were in some so were in some sense sacred places. This might not seem like saying very much, but it's important. It tells us a lot more about the origins of private property than is generally assumed. In rounding off this discussion, we will try to explain why. Let's turn again, let's turn again to the anthropologist James Woodburn and a less well-known insight from his work on immediate, immediate return hunter gatherers 
even among those forager group even among those forager groups for most for their assertive eg egalitarianism he notes there was one striking exception to the rule that no adult should even ever presume to give direct, direct orders to another and that individuals should not lay private claim to property this exception came in the sphere of ritual of the second in Hatsa religion and the religion in the religion of many pygmy groups initiation of into male and something female cults forms the basis of exclusive claims to ownership usually of ritual privileges that stand in absolute contrast into the minimization of exclusive property rights in everyday secular life these various forms of ritual and intellectual property would be observed are generally protected by secrecy by deception and often by the threat of violence here Woodburn cites the sacred trumpets that initiated males of certain pygmy groups keep hidden in secret places in the forest not only are women and children not supposed to know about such sacred treasures should any follow to men to spy on them they will be attacked or even rap strikingly similar practices involving sacred trumpets sacred flutes or other fairly obvious phallic symbols are commonplace in certain contemporary societies of papua new guinea and amazonia and, and amazonia very often there's a complex game of secrets whereby the instruments are periodically taken out of their hiding places and men pretend they are the force of spirits or use they or use them as part of cast of custom masquerades in which they impersonate spirits to terrify women and children now these sacred items are in many cases the only important and exclusive forms of property that exist in societies where personal autonomy is taken to be a paramount value of what we may simply call free societies it's not just relations of common that are strictly confined to sacred contexts or, ev or even occasions when human impersonate spirits so to is so to is absolute or what we would today refer to as private property in such societies they turns out to be a profound form of similarity between the notion of private property and the notion of the second both are essentially structures of of exclusion most of this most of this implicit much of this is implicit if never if never clearly sta started stated or developed in emil in emil duhem's classic definition of the second as that which is the set apart removed from the world and placed on the pedestal at some times literally and at, and at other times figuratively because of its imperceptible connection with the higher force of be or being do him argued that the clearest expression of the sacred was the polynesian term taboo meaning not to be touched but when we speak of absolute private property are we are, are we not talking about something very similar almost identical in fact in its underlying logic and social effects as British legal theorists like to put it, individual property rights are held notional, notionally at least against the whole world. If you own a car, you have the right to prevent anyone in the entire world from entering or using it. If you're thinking about it, this is the only right you have in your car that's really, that's really absolute almost in your car that's really absolute almost almost anything almost anything else you can do with a car is strictly regulated where and how you can drive it park it and so forth but you can keep absolutely anyone anyone else in the world from getting inside it in this case the object is set apart 
fence about by invisible or visible berries, not because it is tied to some supernatural being, but because it's sacred to a spe specific living human individual. In other, in other respects, the logic is much the same. Recognize the close parallels between private, private property and notions of the sacred is also is is also to recognize what is so historically uh, historically odd about European social thought, which is that quite unlikely free societies we take this absolute sacred quality in private property as a paradigm for all human rights and freedoms. This is what the political scientist C. B. Mark Person meant by possessive individualism. Just as every man's home is in is his castle, so your right not to be killed, tortured, or arbitrarily imprisoned rests on this idea that your own that your that you own your own body, just as you own your chattels and possessions, and legally have the right to exclude others from your land or house or car and so on. As we've seen those who did not share the, the, this particular European conception of the sacred could indeed be killed, tortured, or arbitrarily in prison, and from and from and from Amazonia to Oceania, the often were. For most Native American societies, this kind of attitude was profoundly alien. If it applied anywhere at all, then it was only with regard to sacred objects, or what the anthropologist Robert Ulowi termed sacra when he pointed out long ago that many of these most important forms of indigenous property were immaterial or incorporeal, magic formulae, stories, medical knowledge, the right to perform a certain dance or stitch a certain pattern on one's mental. It was often the case that weapons, tools, and even territories used to hunt game were freely shared, but the esoteric powers to safeguard the reproduction of game from one season to the next and ensure luck in the chest were individually owned and jealously guarded. Quite often, sacra have both material and immaterial elements as among the quad killed where ownership of unheirloom wooden vestiges also conveyed the right to the right to gather berries on a certain stretch of land with which to fill it, which in turn afforded in its honor the right to present those berries while singing a certain song at a certain feast and so forth, such forms of sacred property are endlessly complex and variable. Among plain, among plain societies of North America, for instance, sacred bundles, which normally include not only physical objects but accompanying dance, dances, rituals, and songs, were often the only objects in society to be treated as, a, as private property, not just owned exclusively by individuals but also inherited, bought, and sold. Often, the true owners of land or other natural resources were said to be gods or spirits, more humans are merely squatters, poachers, or at best caretakers. People variously adopted a predatory attitude to resources as wheat hunters who appropriate what really belongs to the gods or that of a caretaker where one is only the owner or master of a village or man's house or stretch of territory if one is ultimate, ultimately responsible for maintaining and looking after it, sometimes these attitudes coexist as in Amazonia where the paradigm for ownership or mastery, it, it's always the same word involves capturing wild animals and then adopting them as pets. That is precisely the point where violent appropriation of the natural world turns in, in nurture or taking care. It is not unusual ethnographers working with indigenous Amazonian societies to discover that almost everything around them has an owner or could potentially be owned 
from lakes and mountains to cultivars, liana, goats and animals. As ethnographers also note, such ownership always carries a double meaning of domination and care. To be without an owner is to be exposed and protected. In what anthropologists refer to as autonomic systems, of the kind we discuss for Australia and North America, the responsibility of care takes on a particular extreme form. Each human clan is said to own a certain species of animal, thus making them the bear clan, elk clan, eagle clan, and so forth. But what this means is precisely that members of that clan cannot hunt, kill, harm, or otherwise consume animals of that species. In fact, they are expected to take part in rituals that promote its existence and make it flourish. What makes the Roman law a conception of property the basis of almost all illegal or legal systems today unique is that, the, is that the responsibility to care and share is reduced to a minimum or even eliminated entirely. In Roman law, there are three basic rights relating to possession, usus, the right to use, fructus, the right to enjoy the products of a property, for instance, the fruit of a tree and abusus, the, tri the, right, to, the right to damage or destroy. If one has only the first two, ri two rights, this, referred to as this is refer referred to as usufruct, is not is not considered true possession under the law. The defining feature of true legal property then is that one has ob has the option of not taking care of it or even destroying it at will. We are now finally approaching a general conclusion about the coming of private property, which can be illustrated by one last and especially striking example: the foremost in initiation rituals of the Australian Western Desert. Here, adult males of each clan act as, a, as guardians or custodians of particular territories. There, there are certain sacra known as Churinga or Surinja by the Aranda, which are relics of ancestors who effectively created each clan's territory in ancient times. Mostly, there are smoothed pieces of wood or stone inscribed with the totem emblem. The same object, the same objects could also embody legal title to those lands. Emil, Duch Emil Duchim considered them the very archetype of the sacred things set apart from the ordinary world and according to the diffusion, effectively the holy ark of the clan. During periodic rites of initiation, New cohorts of male Aranda During the period rites of initiation, new cohorts of male Aranda youths are taught about the history of the land and the nature of its resources. There, they are also charged with the responsibility of caring for it, which in particular means the duty of to, the duty to maintain Churinga and, and sacred sites associated with them, with only the initiated should properly know about in the first place, as observed by T. G. H. Strelo, an anthropologist and the son of a Lutheran min min missionary, who spent many years among the Aranda in the early 20th centuries, century, becoming the foremost known Aranda authority on this topic, the way of duty of conflict to terror, torture, and mutilation. One or two months after the novice had submitted to circumcision, there follows the second principal initiation right of that, sub that, su that of sub-incision. The novice has now undergone all the requisite physical operations which, they, which have been designed to make him worthy of man's estate and he has learned to obey the commands of the old man implicitly. He newly found blind obedience stands in striking contrast to the unbridled, unbridled, sorry, unbridled insolence and general unrealness of temper which characterize his behavior in the days of childhood, native children are usually spoiled by their parents, mother's gravity, 
every whim of their offspring, and fathers do not bother about any disciplinary measures. The deliberate cruelty with which the traditional initiation rights are carried, up, carried out at a later age is carefully calculated to punish insolent and lawless boys for their past impudence and to train them into obedient, dutiful citizens who will obey the elderness without a murmur and befit heirs to the ancient sacred traditions of their clans of the clan. Here is another painfully clear example of how behavior observed in ritual context takes exactly the opposite form to the free and equal relations that prevail in ordinary life. In ordinary life, it is only within such context that exclusive sacred forms of property exist. Strict and top-down hierarchies are enforced, and where are thus given the dutiful obe dutifully obeyed. Looking back again to prehistory, it is, as we've already noted, impossible to know precisely which forms of poverty of or ownership existed at places like Goberli Tepe, Poverty Point, Sanai Maruyama, or Stonehenge, any more than we can know if Regalia buried with the princess of the Upper Paleolithic were their personal possessions. What can we know? What can now suggest? In light of the wide of these wider considerations, is that such of is that such carefully coordinated ritual theaters, often laid out with geometrical precision, were exactly the kinds of places where exclusive claims to rights over property, together with straight demands of unquestioning obedience, were likely to be met among otherwise free people. If private property has an origin. It is as old the idea of the sacred, which is slightly as old as humanity itself. The pertinent question to ask is not so much when it when this happened, as how it eventually came to order so many other aspects of human affairs.